Hey everybody. So this particular research paper is called From Limited Data to Rare Event Prediction, LLM-Powered Feature Engineering and Multi-Model Learning in Venture Capital, put out by University of Oxford as well as Avella Research and published on September 9, 2025. This research paper caught my eye overall, frankly, because I kind of like wasn't fully aware, I guess I didn't think it through <laughs> that like uh, a lot of businesses and, and like uh, entities, people overall haven't like thought of these things and don't think of these things in this way. I mean, I've thought to me, this is uh, like the last two, three years, like all I play around with, right? Like <clears throat> uh, when I do like uh, consulting projects, when I'm building out models, etc. like I I'm building it out via these uh, like frameworks and principles etc and i do like uh it does catch me off guard right because like a lot of people when they like uh look at my stuff they'll be like well like you use a, like a lot of less code than i do you use less like uh you like don't rag tune things like that right and then i get into i end up having like a lot of those same conversations and i realize framing it within this it, it's wrapped around this, right? So first of all, let me read the abstract of this paper. I, I want to go through the abstract and the conclusion of this paper, talk a bit about this research paper, and then I'll dive deeper into what I was just talking about there. So with the abstract, this paper presents a framework for predicting rare high impact outcomes by integrating large language models with a multi-model machine learning architecture. This approach combines the predictive strength of black box models with the interpretability required for reliable decision making. We use LM powered feature engineering to extract and synthesize complex signals from unstructured data, which are then processed within a layered ensemble of models including XGBoost, random forest, and linear regression. The ensemble first produces a continuous estimate of success likelihood, which is then thresholded to produce a binary rare event prediction. We apply this framework to the domain of venture capital or VC, where invest investors must evaluate startups with limited and noisy early stage data. The empirical results show strong in performance. The model achieves precision between 9.8x and 11.1x, the random classifier baseline in three independent test subsets. Feature sensitivity analysis further reveals interpretable success drivers. The startup's category list accounts for 15.6% of predictive influence, followed by the number of founders, while education level and domain expertise contribute smaller yet consistent effects. There's a lot to pick out and, and talk about and point out within this, right? I think... The first place that I want to start here is that they're comparing this to normal, like uh, just random, uh, like your baseline classifiers, right? I deal with classifiers and I talk about classifiers a lot on this channel I, and I deal with classifiers a lot uh, within my consulting research, right? Because I do exactly what they do here within this model a lot of times, right? Which is I'll take a baseline classifier, I'll wrap uh, other algorithms around it. Like I do utilize XGBoost uh, a lot. I don't utilize random forests a lot. I utilize linear regression a lot. Uh, and then uh, I like, uh, I, I'm personally, I like swarm algorithms. I like attaching uh, like spiking neural network to these things, etc., and all of those things are in this uh, same realm and category, right? Which is essentially like taking these baseline models. And a lot of people they'll point out and they'll showcase and they'll say like AI has existed since the, the 50s, right? Uh, and they'll they'll uh, show like uh, like here's my PhD from the 1990s where I built like a classifier model, like etc., right? And it's like like all of this is not new uh, within any of that, right? What is new within that though? What we do have access to that we didn't then is a few things. Like, first of all, we have access to these LM models and these very large models that you can attach a classifier to when needed, which does different things and, and changes performance of those things overall. And then the second thing, and the most important thing, like I think a lot of people miss this and don't actually think about this right like um they're like gpus were like not like really in existence so like 
when swarm algorithms first came out, I was like, uh, I'm not, you know, like, I, I was a child. I, was, I remember it was in the 1990s, right? Uh, I was in like, like, uh, in school and I heard about them. Uh, and then that was my first exposure to them. But like during that time, like this was like, uh, I didn't have a GPU. No one I knew had a GPU at that point, right? There was like, uh, one guy I knew his dad worked for Intel. He had a GPU. Like it was like literally like the only guy in the school that I knew, right? And then, uh, of course, now, like, all of these things run on GPUs and GPUs that have now been optimized for 20 years to run these things, right? And people don't understand, like, there's a, a significant and major difference between running a, a classifier today and running a classifier 20 years ago, right? Uh, and then, like, uh, it, it, and then also, too, like, XGBoost didn't exist within then, too. Like, I think XGBoost is, is good to call out within itself overall, right? So I use XGBoost all the time because it's, it's pre-trained classifiers right and it's just library right like uh going back to like a lot of people like they say like how do you do it with so so little code it's like things like this right if i need to i can utilize xg boost and i have a classifier in like two lines of code that's fully trained and ready to go right like uh i like 20 years ago i'd have to build out a full classifier i just use xg boost and, and and there it is right uh and then just pointing those things out and, and diving into that aspect of it this research paper is is great over it's a six pages long so it's not that long overall a research paper uh but the thing that i want to to just highlight specifically on this video is the conclusion and then you can read through the rest of the paper and then we'll dive kind of deeper into these elements so with the conclusion we presented a multi-model framework that integrates machine learning methods with lm powered feature engineering to predict startup success the pipeline was evaluated on funding prediction binary success classification and feature sensitivity analysis consistently demonstrating high precision and robustness in particular the model achieved over 10x the baseline precision while maintaining interpretable feature attributions showing that it can deliver both both predictive power and transparency. These results highlight the potential of combining LLM-derived features with ensemble learning to address rare event prediction tasks such as early-stage startup investing evaluation, where traditional models often fail to generalize. The bottom line within this, right, like I, I get so much like it's it's uh challenging right like in a, a consulting role for example i'll go into an organization and, and then they'll say like well like can you like uh get a model that could actually like like predict our like our leads or our mar our sales or our hr or whatever it is like it, like whatever department focus or whatever it is right it's like uh can you get it to predict that? i say yeah like 100 percent. like i like it's um and i know one million percent that i can do that because I know these methods. I've been playing around with these things for two years. I know exactly how to bolt on an LM model with an XG boost, add some swarm algorithms to that, uh, add a, like a, a, a unique reward model that will reward it very, very specifically uh, where I want it to guide. Guide. I can use some other measurements and, and bolt those on on top of that in order to uh, make my model more robust as far as uh, the inputs that it's going to get from the same amount of data comparatively to uh, anyone else when it comes to those things there's like, like i like at this point like none of this is uh like exploratory to me right like i know exactly going in uh how to do that how to play around with that like i can take a, a pre-trained classifier and I, I run it on some data set and it scores 60 percent i slap some swarm algorithms onto that and then all of a sudden i can get it up to 90 plus percent right and i did i know before i actually do that that i can do that and play around with these things or i can just uh uh, build a scaffolding, hook up that uh, pre-trained classifier, and then run it through an LM model with with uh, that's specific prompts, etc. And then go through it and then do it that way, right? And it's just um, easy to do <laughs> and uh, run through these things and, and then power flexibility access all around that wasn't in existence and didn't exist 20 years ago, right? I think that's that, that's the uh, bottom line of this that I want to get into. It's like, yes, like AI has existed 100% since the, the 1950s uh, as a concept before then, right? Like, like since the 1940s is like the very first like concept of it. But uh, the AI of the 1950s does, looks nothing like the AI of the 1980s, which looks nothing like the AI of the 2000s, which functions nothing like the AI that we have today, right? And it's because there's been... Uh, 
advancements within and, and improvements, et cetera, architectures, new architectures, new algorithms, et cetera, within AI, but then also within computer science, within physics, within every mathematics, within every single other uh, related category outside of these things, right? And then so all of these things coming together means that like a LM model plus your standard classifier is one million percent a different universe than uh, a classifier was 20 years ago and then again it, like even if you strip out the lm model within that like you didn't have access to pre-trained classifiers just like, like off of the fly and then your classifiers weren't running off of gpu which means that they were like 20x or more like less efficient overall and like just period uh in the long run right and then you also didn't have access to the same math that we have today and then it's just all of this is is um there's a like so much innovation going into these things from so many different angles. And I think that's what like the the biggest parts that uh, people miss within this, right? Like a lot of people, they want to like, like it's going to fail because LM models suck. <laughs> like, like it's, and it's like uh, so simple to, to uh, just always like, make things that like at, at, like into that base level or that basis component but none of this is ever that way right it's like and none of this is is uh reliant on lm models like half of this conversation has been excluding the lm model uh very specifically right and it's not necessary within this framework it's a uh significant improvement and enhancement like it's another tool in the tool belt uh that allows you to do cool things within it does okay you want to say that the lm model sucks sure okay I, it's a tool in the tool belt especially when it comes to these things right like an lm model might suck overall it's it, it's it's uh Outputs are non-deterministic, et cetera. But then if I hook up an LLM model and I'm, I'm very specifically having it run linear regression uh, algorithms, it's going to produce a, a deterministic output based off of those linear regression algorithms because that's exactly what a linear regression algorithm does. And I know that because I know how linear regression algorithms work, right? And I know that that will override the LLM in that instance. Just just like highlighting it and pointing out that it's far more important and like to understand Understand and know these things, and then once you understand and know these things on a, a baser level, then they all become building blocks. That's exactly how I look at all of these things, right? These are all individual building blocks to me. XG Boost is a far different building block than Random Forest, and I would want them in two different and completely different situations. They do completely different things. They uh, would be used on completely different data sets, and then also too, same thing with linear regression, right? They're like, uh, and then like these, and we're talking about different modalities at this point with regards towards those different data sets etc right and but i know like all i need is these three words or these three concepts and then i can essentially understand like all the the, the decision tree <laughs> that comes from all of those un in that right and, it, and it's that uh understanding within these things that is most successful overall and i think that's like what most businesses and what most people overall uh, miss within this, right? Everyone wants to, to to shortcut within this. A lot of people see it like, and, and they're not wrong within it, right? I'm making the same uh, exact bet that all of this is very transformative overall. It's going to have uh, like significant impacts, etc. And then within that, it's important to, to understand and learn uh, and then go through that and then start to do that, right? And a lot of people are, are uh, wanting to, to do that without taking like this next layer down right and then if you don't understand that like uh this layer in this universe even exists it seems like magic when some like you're going through and you're like a uh, rag tuning a model for example right that's like a biggest thing like so um why exactly does all of this matter as opposed to like a uh, rag tuning overall right i think that's a big uh discussion probably like a big thing that people have in their minds like why would i use uh, xg boost random forest and or linear regression when i could just like essentially just give the model a bunch of pdfs and docs uh and then just have it rag tune and then it, it would just access those right why would that not do the same thing for a lot of reasons once you understand the actual inner workings within these things right uh the biggest thing is in that the strongest thing to understand within that is that most people don't grasp within this uh these models is that they these models operate off of a what we'll call a horizon window overall right and it's a 
very important concept to understand when we're talking about all of this. And then so within that horizon window, what it essentially uh, means, how it functions within this is that when the model does something one time, uh, that's not going to be the same performance as if it does it two times, it's, which is very inverse to how humans operate, right? Like I get better the more that I do something, the more that I practice something. Like if I uh, start shooting free throws, my free throws, my, my, one thousandth free throw will be far better than my first free throw, right? Uh, LM models and, and uh, like deep neural networks are the exact opposite of that, like literally the opposite of that. Their first free throw is going to be their best free throw. Their first free throw will be a lot better overall than their 10th free throw. <laughs> and, and then so uh, knowing, understanding, uh, and then like uh, within that concept, right? Also too, the second thing within that and, and breaking it down is is that when it comes to rag tuning very specifically, models have a uh, problem when it comes to like that middle data, right? So you throw out a bunch of data, or that data that's in, the, that's in the middle, kind of that needle in the haystack, it's gonna have a hard time and a harder time like pulling that data and understanding that data within it. The third thing within it is, is that when you're drag tuning, none of that data actually interacts with the latent space or updates the weights of the model overall, which are like what is actually like the model's internalization, if you want to call it that. So rag tuning doesn't actually internalize anything for the model. It just fills up that context window. And then again, like these models operate the inverse of humans when it comes to that. So filling up their context window is like scaling down their performance. Like is that the flat out way that it works, right? So if you take it and your LLM model, your baseline is a, a 100, and then you take that model, let's say it has a 1 million token context window, you fill it up to uh, 200,000 tokens, that model operating at 200,000 token context window is not going to be a 100 on that baseline. It's be lower than 100, right? It's going to start to degrade its performance compared to the baseline performance. And that's going to be, again, a kind of counterintuitive concept within this compared to how it works within humans overall, but that's how it works within these models. And then so within this, if you understand these things, it becomes very simplistic, very easy overall to apply these things to concepts like venture capital, whatever you want to, to do it within, right? And then going into these uh, businesses a lot of times and and, 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 and these departments, they, they often like want to mystify it, make it seem like magic. Uh, like, I, I, I don't know, right? but it's like, it's, it's uh, all of it just boils down to understanding how these systems function together, how to actually and properly train these models and systems, and then understanding that it's a process of training and trial and, and error within that, right? It's the exact opposite of software overall. Like it's not just you uh, build this piece of software, throw it in, oh, boop, there it is, right? Like it's, it's, it's uh, this is uh, like, and, and the code, it, code, the code, the data that goes into it, like all of those things are the most meaningless parts of it overall right that's like uh i like overall business like from my experience like so many businesses miss all of these aspects of it right like why like uh why is there this divide where businesses can't seem to understand these things but then you also have all of this research coming out and then saying hey here use these things in, in venture capital or for what literally to predict, I mean, like turn a business into a, a linear prediction machine. Like that's what I don't understand, right? Like if you actually understand what these papers are saying, they're saying that like regardless of your industry, uh, we can turn it into a linear prediction machine. Like given enough data and enough time, it's we can literally, literally predict you put in $1, that $1 is gonna work out to $1.23.457453325. Like, and you'll be able to get it down to like exactly that equation by just simply understanding and implementing these things. But it's, uh, it's such um, Harry Potter, like, <laughs> magicianry to, to have to like get from like that uh, position of understanding to the actual position of understanding of what is actually going on within these things. I do think that there's uh, 
you're starting to see catch up within this, right? Like you're starting to see more and more research papers around these things, which is good, right? Like, and so highlighting, and, and I saw this, it caught my attention, which is why I'm talking about this particular research paper here. I hope uh, that I see more papers along these lines uh, that allow me to get all on the same type of track. And so if I do, I'll make further videos on this same type of topic. For now, I'll leave a link to this research paper from limited data to rare event prediction, LM powered feature engineering and multi-model learning and venture capital. If you like this type of content, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much.